think we're up. Don, we are live. How you doing, bro? You doing good tonight? Good, good. Yeah, thanks for giving me a second chance at this uh, this recording here. Yeah, you know, no problem at all, man. I, I'm still doing a uh, learn as I go too. Is when I'm doing these things, it's like what works, what doesn't work. When you think all your equipment's up and ready to go, sometimes it's not, and then you have static on the other end, and you don't know why, and it's just like, what the hell? Yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm glad you're here. I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with you. And and one of the things, uh, I feel like you probably get this question a lot of times, but I guess we should start this off that way some you know, audience members get to know you, that, you know, uh, what was the motivation behind, you know, you have single seat mindset and I know you got a whole book series going on with it. So what was kind of the, uh, the motivation about it or why did, what inspired you to do it? Yeah. So I guess if I was to kind of, you know, if I was, if I envisioned standing in a, a coffee line and somebody turned around and was like, well, what do you do? And I was like, well, I own a couple of businesses. Well, tell me about those businesses. I would say that, you know, single scene mindset, the, the idea behind it came from my fighter pilot background. So aviation, um, we found that, you know, goal oriented individuals, they get frustrated when they, when they're put in rigid structures or slow processes or, you know, long winded programs. Um, other things that frustrate them are like adherence to like bureaucratic, uh, unnecessary protocols sure. and there's like no outcome, right? So you're just kind of you're like just talking or there's stuff going on. It doesn't really make sense. Right. So, you know, fighter pilots like myself, we're trained to make split decisions at, you know, 800 plus miles an hour. And those, those quick decision skills, uh, they were, have been incredibly useful applied to, uh, sports and golf and my other real estate business, uh, and even high performance professions, you know, we're seeing, uh, kind of across the board, it's kind of helping people with that. So, what we did is we created the largest online community of fighter pilot guides. Um, and what we're aiming to do is to, to take the action takers, the big goal achievers and guide them in short, impactful steps, uh, in the attempt to like help them control their, their future success. Right. But we also realized that, um, you know, when you're on that path, right. And you're at a full sprint, uh, you don't have a whole lot of time to like read a book. You just need like a little nugget. And that little nugget is like, it's kind of like a, a coach going, yo dog, like you need to go this way a little bit sure. and then you're, you're on the right vector. So that's, that's kind of the Genesis behind the, uh, the single seat, uh, fighter pilot mindset. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, I'm one of these people that have always been hesitant when decisions come my way to, you know, oh, I got to stop and think about this. I got to try to analyze every little situation I can and basically overthink the whole thing and then work the opportunity and comes up missed for me. And so this, you know, it seems like, and what I'm getting at is like, it seems like a lot of people, you know, when the opportunity comes, you know, they got to strike, you know, and have quick decisions and decision-making, you know, and, you know, yeah. not to be too cliche or too dumb or whatever, but, you know, like, when, you know, speaking of fire fighter pilots and stuff, you know, like when top or, uh, you know, top gun, you know, uh, Maverick says like, Oh, if you think up there, you're dead, you know? Yeah. Is that kind of, <laughs> is that kind of where it comes Yeah. From? If you think you're dead now, now granted, I will say that, um, you know, that all fighter pilots, my, myself included, I was, you know, I was introverted in, I think introversion is a little bit contextual. Sure. So, you know, when you're a little kid, you're not introverted around your parents usually, but it, you know, in certain situations you are. And I was kind of that kid. And what helped me break out of my shell was, was learning to fly. I started flying when I was 16. So that kind of helped me, you know, kind of get, you know, establish some like decision-making skills and an airplane, it doesn't let you sit and figure things out, right? You're going, you're going in three dimensions. And the, the cool thing about, you know, aviation, at least in my mind is that it's very checklist driven and you build these these processes because as a humanoid, like you can only make one decision at a time. Yeah. Um, and as a fighter pilot, if you misprioritize and you put the wrong decision in front of the other one, you're now kind of in a pickle. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you say it's cliche and all that kind of stuff, but that swagger and that a lot of people think it's cockiness and it, and it is at times, um, and come off that way. But you know, there's, there's a lot of value to, just the training and just the very specific do this, then this, then this, and this, and this, and this really fast. And then you get this. And I'll say that, um, you know, I, I have talked to people, students too, because I teach in the F 16, 
uh, basic course here. So these dudes are just learning how to fly fighter jets. And I get students that are like, well, I didn't have the information or whatever. And we can, we can teach them those steps to like move past that. So. Is it one of those things that obviously I feel like I already know the answer to this question, but you know, the more you do it, like you said, you were at 16 years old, started flying. And so 16 years old, you start to learn, you know, the processes, the best practices, the best principles. And then it comes almost a second nature, maybe a sixth sense, what some might say to you. And you automatically, you, you, you know, when a certain situation comes up, you already know how to react. Yeah. I'd, I'd say that, that with experience and, you know, uh, a lot of guys say with more air under your ass, you're going to have, you know, the, the experience to make those decisions. That's absolutely true. I will say that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not the, the, the tip of the spear when it comes to like the best fighter pilot that ever walked the face of the earth. Um, what I, I think that I do bring a lot of game to is that I've been a, you know, a downhill ski instructor, a music instructor, a math instructor, a civilian flight instructor, you know, a military flight instructor. And I, I have a very good way of breaking something down with like, Hey dude, here's three steps. Just do this thing next time. Here's your number one thing. And then like, here are the steps to get to that. Um, and to be able to break it down. I think that's important. Um, in regards to your question about, you know, have an air under your ass to make those decisions. You know, if you make, I'm still searching for that perfect flight. Mm. I haven't found it. Um, but what do you mean by that? What do you mean by the perfect? Well, I mean like a flight that you take, you, you, uh, you get in the jet, the jet starts perfectly. The taxi routes, perfect. The takeoffs, perfect. The, 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 you know, the fight and the execution's perfect. And then you come back and the debrief is just perfect. Right. And like everything was perfect. Like it doesn't exist. Right. It's a unicorn. Uh, so, um, but I will say with time, you know, I have about, uh, in, in relation to context, like fighter pilots that have a thousand hours in a fighter jet, that's a decent amount of time. Um, and I have about 4,000 hours of flight time. So I will say that, a you know, I have a lot of old man strength. I may not know like the exact thing that you should do in every, you know, tactical situation but in regards to like seeing stuff before. If you fly enough, you see a student mess up or you mess up yourself, or you've seen a microburst come in or a thunderstorm come in, you kind of have like all of those hip pocket things that, you know, you can yeah. do. But there's a lot of variables up there too. I mean, speaking of, you know, you, you saying, you know, there's some things you can do, but like you just talked about, you know, the weather probably could change at it instant right or you know a malfunction on the plane and i'm very ignorant when it comes to planes and talking so if i misspeak miss or miss speak yeah uh just go ahead and correct me or put me in my no that's yeah 100 true yeah so yeah so um so yeah but it's like one of those things that you know if you know the air changes or the thunderstorm comes in out of nowhere or whatever that you have to start to figure out you know how to be comfortable in those situations you know and like not get under pressure not get you know figure out what you got to do to get to point a to point b yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, and again, searching for that perfect flight, it, it, it's kind of a, a misnomer. It doesn't exist. Right. Cause you don't have a perfect day where the weather's perfect and literally everything has lined up with the red carpet for everything to go perfectly. So, you know, thinking on your feet or I guess thinking in the ejection seat, uh, <laughs> real time, uh, you can't hit pause. It's not like a video game where you can put another quarter in and start over or just hit restart. Right. Sure. So going back a little bit though, at 16, you knew you wanted to start flying planes. I was actually seven. Ooh. Um, and the, the point to this story is that you never underestimate the, the influence you might have on somebody else. But at seven, I built a, like a Vietnam era, uh, plastic fighter jet with my old man Ooh. on the, uh, the dining room table. And, uh, I don't have it sitting here on my desk, but I still have it. Right. So it's, it's about, uh, you know, 30 plus years old now. And, uh, since I was, you know, really young, you know, I just kind of always knew that aviation was, you know, I either wanted to work wrench on airplanes or fly them or whatever. And there was some, there were some definite things that happened in my life that kind of pushed me in that direction. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you had said earlier on in the interview where you're like, I need some time to analyze that and think about that, dude, there were years where I was analyzing and thinking, right? So 
I was, I didn't have like the split decision making skills. Cause that's a, you can learn that you got a plastic brain. You can go from like very prefrontal cortex type thinking where it's, you're standing in the batter's box. You're trying to hit a baseball, right? And you're just like thinking about it or like golf, right? That's the worst. If you think about your swing and you don't have like that muscle memory. So like, you know, you haven't moved that into your muscle memory, then it's going to be difficult, right? It's going to be robotic. It's not going to work out. Sure. Yeah. So that's, that's a cool moment that, you know, you just shared that it's one of those things that is almost, you know, like the life or the universe was kind of already directing you into the phase or path they wanted you to go into and that. You know, and you found it and it seems like it was your niche, you know, it seems like, you know, the way you're talking about it right now, it's one of these things that, you know, you're very passionate about. It seems like, and, you know, like you said you had 4,000 hours, you know, flight time. So, I mean, that's got to mean something that compared to, you know, like you said, you had old man strength, you know, compared to, I don't know. I mean, what do other young, there's 4,000, I mean, compared to like what people, you said a thousand hours is pretty good. I mean, is that where you're a thousand hours, you got, like, oh, I'm good. I don't want to go up. And no. Anymore. So, I mean, a lot of the. So if you, if you're in, uh, you know, cause I was, I was active duty air force for a number of years. Um, and I'm a, I'm a reservist now full-time okay. reservist, um, which is great. Cause I don't have to move around six moves in 10 years was as much as we could, uh, you know, take two deployments, six moves, 35 temporary duty assignments all over the world. Like it was a lot for mama and, and the kiddos there. So, um, you know, you knowing, uh, I guess my question for you, like to, to flip it on that, like, do you think that it's pretty rare nowadays for, um, for people to kind of know what they want to do? You know, there's a lot of figuring that goes on. Like what? Yeah, I haven't been able to figure that out. It's, I think it's super rare. And just because that, you know, I work in higher education and I used to supervise students in my, one of my previous jobs. And it seems like nobody could ever really say there was there was a handful. There's some outliers out there that always like knew what they wanted to do. They knew the path, what to do, and how to get there, and all that good stuff. But half the people, and I and I'm kind of, I'm one of these people too that was just fine by the seam in my pants, you know, and just I had no clue what I wanted to do. I thought I did, but you know, when I graduated, I was like, ooh, you know, I didn't get the you know a teaching job. I was like, well, what do I got to do now? I still need a job, and you know, yeah. I'm 36 years old now, and I got a good career going, but it took me a while to finally say that, Ooh, what do I want to do? You know? Huh? And, do you and think thought, there was anything, do you think there's anything that could have, I don't know, spurred you along that path? And, and I'm asking this kind of like, I'm just searching for this answer. I'm searching for some ideas from people, you know, like how do you, what, why did that click with me? And yeah. why does it not click with other people? I don't know. I wonder, sometimes I wonder if it's so much information thrown at younger generations. Now. And I, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but you don't, you seem yeah. like a young guy, but you know, there's so much information that goes at people now that, you know, one day they want to go be a fighter pilot. The next day it's like, Oh, maybe I want to be a physical education. Teacher. That's what I thought. And then at one point I thought I was gonna be a strength and conditioning coach. And then I find out more information about it, what the job entails. Stuff. I was like, well, maybe I don't want to spend, you know, 16 hours in a college weight room gym, you know, like all day long weight huh. body. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's too many options and, and probably I'm the, I'm definitely probably the last guy that should be talking about it, but that's kind of my take on it. I guess that, you know, and there is moments in life. And like I said, there's outliers that people will find themselves in situations like, you know, you have building a plane with your old man and stuff in which, you know, I never, yeah. my parents were divorced. And so growing up, you know, my mm -hmm. biological father's a dairy farmer. And so like that was never like really inbred it onto me. And I think that was just because of my life experience. You know? Yeah. But you know, well, you brought something up there. Like, you know, I maybe take it for granted or, um, you know, dads or, or like a father figure. Right. Cause, um, you know, cause life happens, right. Like, and you, you know, you may have a split family or your, you know, parents may not be together or whatever, but like, um, that's something else that has been, I've been thinking about too, is I'm like, was it, was it because dad was introducing that to me? Like, what if it was my uncle? And then that kind of dovetails into the second story where the seed for the seed was planted for aviation when I was seven, but when I was 12, it had kind of like grown to be like, I think I want to fly airplanes. And my uncle took me onto the flight line. He was a uh, maintainer with Alaska airlines. And he took me out to, uh, it was probably 737 or something big, right? Big airplane took me up the ladder. We went onto the flight deck and the, the mechanics were doing engine runs. Okay. And so I'm this little 12 year old punk, right? Like standing on the flight deck 
and I'm looking at all these switches and I look at the big window and that was a defining day because at that point I thought I wanted to be an aviation mechanic. I wanted to do something with airplanes. I liked airplanes. I figured if I was a mechanic, I could meet pilots and fly sure. right in my 12 year old brain. Like it sounded, it sounded good. Uh, but that was a defining day where I sat there and I was like, I don't know if I want to wrench on these things. Like I just want to sit in that seat and have the best seat in the airplane and push all those buttons, whatever they might be <laughs> and fly the things. And I had no clue no clue if that was even possible. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's like a, a string of events, right? Like maybe it's like you were saying, like maybe had your dad done something and then like a coach or a mentor or some, something along the way had kind of put some fins on, you know, it'll kind of give you some vector where you need to go. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point too, that I don't know. There is, like I said, there's outliers and there's kids that, know ultimately what they want to do with their life. And I don't know what that is, why they got that. Like you said, it was seeing a movie or seeing, you know, a, yeah. their parents do something. It's like, Oh, I'm doing that for my life. But there's others that, you know, they still don't know. And I don't, you know, when I was trying to advise them, you know, as far as their life direction, I, was like, well, I don't know. I mean, I didn't really know I was going to make it this far with my life. You know, I just, you know, started, yeah. I just went to college cause I thought that was the thing to do. You know, I didn't huh. have a general idea why I should go except that, you know, most successful people go to college and if you don't go, you're going to be a loser. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. Like really why I was like, and even I didn't even get into the universities I applied for. So I was like, well, my only backup choice right now is just to go to community college. Yeah. I'll just keep figuring it out from there. And yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, luckily I found my way, I guess, and found some things I got into, but you know, if I truly found a passion, yeah, I mean, sort of, but you know, it's just I, one of those things, you know, if you wish you could go back to when you were 16, like, oh, I wish I would have found that then and then put, you know, X amount of years into it. You know, I'd be a veteran by now, you know, I'd be yeah. mastering that. It. So hmm. and I don't know. And, I, you know, again, I don't know a direct answer of why maybe younger generations have no clue where they want to be. But maybe it's too much social media. Maybe it's too much a little regarding to mental illness cases. But, yeah, yeah I don't know, man. Hmm. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's cool that people like, you know, yourself, when you find like, Ooh, I want to go do that. And you succeed at it and you're like, Ooh, I'm doing it. And now you've been doing it. It's yeah. bad. Ooh, man. Yeah. Thanks. For you. Yeah. And even though you said you were like, did you say you taught math along the way, music and. Yeah, I was, I was not a math, a certified math teacher, but I did uh coach or at least it was selfish really is I was teaching math in college because I was. I tested into math that I had no business being in. <laughs> and so I would teach math to figure out, um, you know, I could follow a checklist and kind of like outline something, but it was more to, to talk out loud, to give myself repetitions and then also to learn how other people learn. Right. And I think that's kind of been one of the best things about being an instructor, whether it was, I don't know if it was legal or not, but I was a downhill ski instructor when I was 14. My uncle was like the lead dude uh, on the hill and he got me a job. So I started teaching people how to do stuff. Nice. And anytime that I've tried to started teaching somebody how to do stuff, I suck, right? I suck because I, I don't know. I don't really know what I know until you teach it. And so I think I didn't really know that when I was a kid, but as I started teaching, I found out very quickly how little I knew. And because maybe it was fear, maybe it was just, I didn't want to look like an idiot. Mm. I had to put a little effort into like, not sounding like a dork and figure out how to explain things in simple steps. Right. Cause sure. it's very different teaching a, a you know, an eight year old kid that's fairly athletic or a 60 year old dude who's never strapped on skis. Right. Sure. So just, how, how do you talk to somebody like that? Right. And I didn't have those thoughts when I was that little. And I didn't even have those thoughts when I was like an 18 year old civilian flight instructor. Right. Like I didn't know, but you figure it out as you go and, and you start to subconsciously, right? Like that's the old man strength. You start to subconsciously like alter your personality, not your personality, but like your teaching style, right. Yeah. To like fit who you're teaching, right? Like, Oh, you know, I remember I had a, 16 year old kid in high school, I was teaching how to fly. And I had a, oh man, I think he was 66 years old and he was an engineer. So very analytical, old around the block, 
I can't say anything. And he's just going to go, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Like, whereas the 16 year old kid, it's like, all right, dude, we're going to take off and we're going to fly upside down. Right. Like <laughs> the young kid's just going to be like, sure, let's do that. Whereas the old guy is going to kind of raise an eyebrow and go, I don't know if that's a good idea. Exactly. Yeah. No, I can so, really a lot. You know, uh, back in 2013, I found CrossFit and started coaching maybe a year later. And it's one of those things like I had to learn how to read the room, you know, and like how I would talk to uh, an 18 and 20 year old kid would not be the same way if a 50 or 60 year old person came in and, you know, like, you know, hey, you know, the, the way you talk to them, I mean, let's like yell at, not that really yell at them, but, you know, the way you want to fix them, you know, and, and it's just like when mostly people who know how to move their body kinesiology wise, like, you know, if you, you say stretch straight in your back, most you're like, oh, okay, cool. I got you. But like maybe somebody who's never picked up a barbell before or done anything, they're like, wait, what do you want me to do? You know, and they start yeah. doing completely different. And then you're like, you're not going to cuss on me. You're like, well, come on, idiot. Like, what the hell, dumbass? Yeah. You know, so that was one thing I had to learn was that, you know, I was a decent athlete and still am, but for CrossFit, but coaching and like teaching other people is a completely different animal. And, yeah. you know, and it was one of those things that also there was people there, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to listen to this guy just because they either thought they were better than me or they were, you know, had, you know, years on me or whatever. It's like, cool. I mean, but did you have to run into anything like that when you were a flight instructor, like young bucks coming in and being like, oh man, I'm already better than Slice over here. What does he know? Yeah. And I think, um, I think there was, a, there was a few things cause I, I did, I did get that, but, um, you know, and, and it's, and you'll see this too. Like somebody will judge the book by its cover. Everybody does it. I do it. I do it too. Right. Sure. Like this kid's super young, almost unanimous, unanimously for probably the first five, six, seven, eight years, I was teaching people how to fly. I was younger than the people that I was teaching how to fly. I started when I was 18 and then I joined the air force, you know, at 21. And then I was teaching people how to fly at like 23. And most of the kids that were like starting that path were 25. So I was usually ahead age wise. And the difference being is that, um, I was so driven to, to like a fault, right. Where I was kind of like an introvert, uh, in, in regards to like learning every single detail, learning all the different things. And I wasn't married at the time too. So I, I immersed myself into knowing all the data. And I think, you know, yeah, you get a little bit of the, what's this guy saying? Like, is this, is this legit type of thing when he first shows up, but then you can really overcome a lot of that new stuff, that new guy, whatever you want to call it, stigma, if you know your stuff. Sure. And the thing that I didn't used to do, but is really powerful is you can start out and say, you can just answer those questions that, that they have. Hey, look, I know that I'm young, but I know my stuff. Sure. And, and I'm, I'm humble enough to say, I don't know, but I know where to find it. And I think doing that, right. Cause there's been times where I've messed that up in my career where I'm like, I give an answer or whatever, and it's, it's close enough or whatever. Right. But then th those dudes are going to go look it up. And then you look like a total clown. You look like a class clown. Right. So <laughs> I think that was kind of the thing that helped me overcome a lot of those early, you know, roadblocks. And I was, I was, I was a little bit more reserved, but I, I knew you, if you put me in an airplane with somebody, that was my comfort zone. So like I said earlier, introversion is kind of contextual. And if you put me in an airplane or you put me in front of a class to teach people how to fly or talk about airplanes, I'm that's, uh, that's pig and mud. I, I'm happy there and I can talk. Now you put me in a room at like a, a mixer with, you know, people that I don't know, dude, I'm going to be pretty quiet because sure. I don't know what I don't know. I don't know who's in that room and there's always a bigger fish. Oh yeah. Yeah. What's so the I'm just Got Confidence builds confidence. So yeah, I'm the same way. You know, if you told me to go teach a flight class or whatever, I'd be like, Oh yeah. <laughs> Who wants to read for page one, you know, just to get to yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, and that's one thing that, you know, and I enjoy having conversations like that. So I mean, and that was a good point that you brought up too. And I'm kind of losing my thoughts here, but that, you know, you're not, a, you're not afraid to be humble and say, I don't know, but I'll go look it up. And that's one thing I got from Jocko Willick's book was extreme ownership. And he was just talking about, man, Hey, if you don't know something, just own it, man, you know, and just, you know, man up, it's not a big deal, you know, and I've gotten more respect for people who do that rather than try to, 
you know, beat around the bush and find something random to say. And then it just like makes zero sense. And you're like, man, just say you don't know. It's no big deal. Like I, you know, tell me, I don't care. But yeah. But one thing I've noticed is that, like I said earlier, is like having these conversations like this, it's kind of cool to, you know, ask questions and have, you know, let my curiosity spark and find out more about things that I don't know. And like, you know, like, Ooh, why did, uh, why did Don want to go fly planes? And why, you know, why is he doing what he's doing? And why did he go write the books now and stuff? And that, you know, it's really cool to like kind of feed my, you know, my curiosity. And in that way, when people come and talk to me a little about it, I'm be like, well, you know, I don't know a lot about it, but I can tell you a couple of things. And, from experts that I've heard and, you know, and it's cool, you know, it's just something that you can share your knowledge with and the passing, I guess, younger generations, it's like the old guy giving down the knowledge to the, uh, the young fighter coming in or something. So, yeah, that's where, so that's where the, uh, the single seat wisdom, um, series of books. That's why we started. That was the, the genesis of that was COVID, right? So we saw, uh, a lot of the younger students were struggling during COVID because they were on different shifts. They couldn't just hang out and get a lot of that corporate knowledge, you know, from, you know, the older fighter pilots sitting around in the squadron and coming in and being like, you know, they can ask questions, you know, they have to, they have to come into the squadron and then they have to be out by a certain time before the next people come in. So the single seat mindset company at large was started during that time. Uh, to help those dudes. And this was actually the, the business was built for those dudes. So it was an online, uh, like short punchy message every week. And it was a blog and then it became a, a website. And then I looked at some of the older guys and I'm like, dude, you're retiring next year. Yeah. Are you going to let your story die? You're just going to, you're going to walk off. You're going to go fly for the airlines. All this stuff is awesome, but dude, your story's going to be dead. And I'm like, uh, would you entertain you know, me compiling a bunch of stories, just fighter pilot stories that are short, you can read in 10 to 15 minutes. And then you put your wisdom at the end of the chapter and then single seat wisdom, that book series started. And we're actually publishing the second one here on veterans day in November this year. Uh, So we got 40 fighter pilot stories, dude, this stuff doesn't exist. You know, I would have loved this as a kid growing up. Oh, cracking a book open and having 20 fighter pilot, t- you know, story time. So that's where that idea kind of, kind of grew from. Um, I had, I had no, I didn't know that that's where it was going to go, but you know, after the the blog and then somebody's like, dude, what are you, what are you doing for these students here? And I'm like, well, I'm just giving them little snippets so they can kind of get through COVID. And you know, it's like two to three minutes a week. So these, you know, cause as you're, as you're trying to like, do something that takes a lot of your mental stuff. You don't have a whole lot of time to like read books. Like I was saying, so it was just short. And that's what I promised the students. I'm like, you read this in two minutes. It's, you're going to hear a lot of stories about how I screwed up and how, what not to do. Um, but then how to overcome those things and how to avoid those mistakes as a new guy. And then, you know, the single seat wisdom, you know, book series for your guys that are, that are watching the video here. Uh, it's, it's pretty sweet. I mean, I'm, I'm humbled. I I've, you know, I wrote it, I wrote the big part of the book and then I wrote a chapter, but this second book that we're publishing, dude, it's literally me just herding cats right now. So, you know, I can put the manuscript together and get everybody to get their chapters in. Uh, and I'd hope to do one every year and then have like a Bible, right? Like, a oh. you know, hundred stories from fighter pilots that are short, you know, and you can, you're struggling with something. You can just flip it open and be like, Oh, I remember so-and-so talking about this and it's dude in 10 minutes or less, you can kind of have the answer to your, your problem. And that's what's a, what a lot of people want nowadays, you know, and I'm one of them that, you know, I can only, you know, I try to set aside, uh, set aside time each day to read. And so if I can knock out whatever in 10 minutes or find like an answer to a problem. It's like, yeah, then I'm good to go. I mean, I feel like I accomplished something for that day. And plus, you know, I mean, with, I don't know who you want to experts, experts are saying that most people's attention span is like two minutes now anyway, but <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that seems perfect, you know, and like you said, you know, growing up, you know, I grew up in a very rural area, but I didn't really know anything about, you know, the military or you know, fighter pods or anything that from that nature. I mean, my information came from the movie Top Gun, the first one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when, you know, you see all the cool stuff about it. You don't really see what really goes down into it though. And all the, yeah, the, yeah. All the details and stuff. And just not anybody can just be a fighter pilot, but you know, it's a different mindset. It's a different, type of uh person you know they're, they're built different 
so to speak. It just can't be like Tom Cruise, but yeah. yeah. But yeah, information like that would have been cool to have. And that way you could actually get real time stories. And, you know, even today with podcasts and like yourself, like people can be over there and listen to actually what oh, it takes to be a fighter pilot or, you know, the cool, the bad things about it, the good things about it and all that good stuff. So you yeah, said, you said you screwed up a couple of times. I mean, is that one time you, that comes to Oh man, I wish it was just a couple of times. I, I'm finding that, you know, there's a couple of, uh, there's a couple of things that like, you can read a ton of books. You can, you know, talk to a bunch of people and I, I, there's like some similarities and you kind of kind of already hinted at it, but like, I've found that the, the, the peak performers of the world, the, the athletes or whatever, they're, they're pretty goal oriented and they're pretty like laser focused. Like I'm going to, I'm going to get there. Yeah. And, and, and the, the thing that the theme after reading all these books and like listening to people is just action. Right. So that's kind of the first thing is like, you have to start, right? Like, what do they say? A, a journey of a thousand steps starts with the first step or whatever, something like that. I butchered the, I butchered the quote, but I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the other piece to you, um, that you kind of hinted at was, you know, it's, was it the mindset? Was that the question that you had or was I, it? I said something about like a fighter pilot's mindset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, you know, there, there are, I will say there are some, um, you know, physical limitations, like, dude, if you got, if you got diabetes or you're going to have a heart attack or you're like, you can't see, obviously that's a, a huge, I was going to ask you about that. Like, yeah. That's a that huge thing. Closed? Yeah. I mean, you can, nowadays you can get your vision corrected, you know, via LASIK or there are, there are approved, no kidding laser beams that you can shoot at your eyeballs and, and fix your, fix your vision. You can also fly with glasses and a lot of the airframes too. Uh. So if, if, if that's a misnomer, like if somebody's listening to this and they're like, man, I've always wanted to be a fighter pilot, but I can't see very well. I'll go get LASIK or get some, some glasses and you should be fine. Okay. Um, the big thing though, you kind of hinted at was, you know, I was, this surprised me. I was talking to my old man this weekend and he said, I never really, painted you as a fighter pilot growing up. Like you didn't have the, you didn't have the personality and the swagger and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I think there's a lot of value for people to hear that, right? Sure. Because you don't have to have that. That's not part of being a, a fighter pilot. So, um, aside from the single seat wisdom series, which are probably geared more for like the 16 year old, to 29 year old kind of in that age group. Now, I've had guys that own 4,000 apartment units read this book and they're like, dude, this book is sweet. It's applicable to business and entrepreneurship and, and all that stuff. And these guys are in their fifties. So yes, there are some, you know, some outliers, but, um, that book kind of is, you know, single C wisdom is kind of geared for that age group. We are actually writing a book for the younger age group. So think like eight years old to 16 years old. Okay. And as I was talking to my old man, it kind of helped me clarify my messaging because I was like, what would, what would Chris want to hear at 10 years old? Yeah. Right. What would you want to hear as a kid? And so I broke it down in three steps. Right. And the first one is, is the mindset piece of it. Right. And there's a lot that goes into that, but are you a person that just wants to sit on the couch and, and, you know, sc scroll up on your Instagram feed and play video games and like, I don't know, smoke dope with your friends. Well, dude, don't read this book. It's not for you. But Hey, if you're, if you're on a sports team, uh, if you're in a math club, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to do stuff, that's hard, right? Ooh, there we go. Yeah. If, if it takes the brain power to do that, right. If you want to own a soccer team, if you want to be a billionaire, right. If you want to do those things, the mindset starts first, right? So you have to go, I, I, I think I can do that. Right. So your mind goes that, and there's, there's more to it. But then the second piece of it is, which I've, I think you kind of helped me clarify, uh, the messaging on the second piece, which is, is permission. And maybe I'll change that. But like, dude, a lot of times, like you're saying, did you even know that you could be a fighter pilot growing up? No, never even given the option. Right. So dude, you, one, you have to give yourself the permission, but then dude, you need a coach or a guide who's going to help you take those steps, even if it's not all the way there. But if your mindset goes, dude, I think that this is what I should do. You need to give yourself the permission, but then you need a coach or a guide to go, dude, you can do that. And my old man, my uncle, you know, there was a, the chief flight instructor at the civilian school when I was 15, I talked to him and he's like, oh yeah, you can fly these airplanes. 
And I was like, dude, I didn't even cross my mind. Right. So mindsets, number one, you need permission for yourself and from maybe from somebody else, a coach or a guide. And in my case, like the books that we write, I'm the guide. Yeah. You're the hero, dude. Like I'm the guy just like, here's follow these steps. And then, you know, the third one, we're kind of attempting to, you know, flesh out the details on that, but ready, set action, right? You got to go and do it. The action piece, like I had hinted at it before, but dude, you can read books, you can analyze, you can read blogs and, you know, go find everybody's doing stuff. But like that third piece, I can't help you with. For sure. You have to get out, you put your phone down, stop looking at Facebook, right? Don't play video games. You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, go ready, set, go. You know, and for what you asked me earlier about people not knowing what they want to do in life, and you just kind of sparked something in my brain is that, you know, like, let's say if I came up to somebody and, you know, at a young age said, oh, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be a fighter pilot or, you know, I want to drive, you know, a battleship or I don't know, sell a battleship. I don't even know. But, you know, it's like people, and I'm, you know, generally speaking, of course, there's guidance counselors, maybe teachers, you know, family members. You say something like that to them and they'll be, oh, you'll never be one of those. You'll never be an astronaut. You'll never be a fighter pilot. And it's just, I don't know if it's just because they want to rain on your parade or it's just one of those things that, you know, if somebody's like, oh, you know, I want to be play basketball in the NBA. Well, no, only, you know, X amount of people make it to the NBA. And then like their dreams are just shot. And they're like, all right, well, I guess I'll just you know, stop, you know, and just they don't really pursue anything after that just because they got beaten down. And I like what you said that, you know, you got to at least, you know, yeah, you can be beat down and have a bad day for that, but then you got to get up, go do something about it. You know, if you really, really want to do it, you can't go let your guidance counselor or some Rift Raft teacher just cause their dreams ever, <laughs> just cause their, te- their dreams never came true that, you know, let's, let's make sure that your dreams don't come true. You know, you got to start fighting against and go th- fight through those barriers, you know, and that's when you know it's really hard because like you said, if everybody wanted to be a fighter pilot, if everybody wanted to go write a book, then everybody would be doing it, right? You know, yeah. but it's hard. It's really hard. And those things that make you hard is when you find out how tough you are and where you want to go. You know, and for example, what I'm getting at is that and I've said it on here, but last couple of podcasts, but I signed up for a half marathon with some friends. We're doing a tri um a triathlon and I'm doing the half marathon part. And I've never ran that far in my life. You know, I'm training for it, of course, but I knew it would be hard for me. And I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna suck, but I want it to be hard for me. I'm gonna, <laughs> I want to challenge myself and find out what I'm made of and see if I can do it. It's like you're talking about mindset, you know, and then it's like, oh, if I can get through that, man, daily life is just easier now, you know, just so somebody cuts me off and like, okay, no big deal, you know. I've had about yeah. five worst days, you know, no big deal. And yeah, I, I think. I guess my point is for all that rant is that I wish more people young and older would get through that in their head, you know, to say, Oh, it's going to be hard times. Some days you're going to suck, but if you really want something, you got to keep pushing forward. Yep. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. I think, you know, and that, that kind of, um, you know, the, the steps, the mindset, the, uh, I'm digging deep here. Cause this is all brand new stuff that we started like kind of, gelling through. So like, you're, you're one of the first to hear about these ideas, but like mindset permission and then action. But then the, the, you know, the part of the action piece is like a lot of young people too would go, well, how, how how do I, like, where do I even start? Right? Like I visualize that I want to be a pilot. Like what what are all the steps in between? Yeah. Well, dude, you're, it's not the, the shortest line is from, you know, a to B, right? Like just a straight line, but it's, it's more like, when you go to a bowling alley and you put the little bumpers down and the ball goes down, you know, a three-year-old rows the ball down the alley and it just kind of zigs back, back and forth. And I think if you're okay, zigging and zagging a little bit, that is more likely to happen than for you to just hit the target right off the bat, right? Like, Hey, take this dart, hit the bullseye, dude. I, unless you're just a gifted savant with darts, which I don't know if that even exists. Right. But you, you hit the nail on the head is, is the, the protection piece. So I think it's a lot of different things and I don't, I'll have to sum this, like kind of like think about how I'm going to verbalize it, but like, like your, your counsel that you were talking about, Oh, well you can't do that. Mm. And dude, I remember distinctly when I was, I was in college and I was taking a aeronautical class or something. Right. And the dude that was teaching the class, the professor his his call sign was Harley and his last name was Davidson. And so <laughs> I was like, 
dude, this guy's name's not Harley. Right. But that's how he introduced himself. So I went up after, you know, he got done with the class and I was like, is your name like really Harley? And he's like, Oh yeah, man, I'm a, I'm a 810 fighter pilot. And that's what they gave me. They gave me a, a cool call sign, which is pretty rare, but like they gave me Harley. And so I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm in speaking of like taking steps. I was like, I'm in civilian flight training and I'm learning how to fly airplanes. I love it. I want to be an instructor. I want to do all this stuff. And I mean, as you can tell, I'm an action oriented person. I'm taking steps, but dude, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how the, how, like, can you give me some vector? And I remember it like it was yesterday. He looks at me, he's got kind of a Southern draw and he's like, Oh hell kid. If I did it, you can do it. And dude, that was the second thing that was, I had the mindset, right? I was doing the action, but dude, I had been given little bits of permission along the way to get there. And he gave me the ticket. He gave me the like, dude, just s- stop whining, go do it. Right. And he didn't give, he didn't lay it out for me. Uh, I had to figure out how to apply to the air force. I had to figure out that dude, they lost my paperwork three times. Damn. And so as a young kid working three jobs, um, dude, I lived in Tucson, Arizona. My, my AC didn't work. My car would overheat. I was paying for my own gas, dude. I was eating 89 cent bean burritos with no cheese and cutting them in half. Cause I didn't have any, I didn't have any dough. And so talking with him, in class, you know, I'm wearing my ragtag jeans and just trying to like make ends meet. And he's like, just do it. And I'm like, all right, that's, I needed to hear that. And so that kind of going back to, you never know, you never know that impact that you're going to have on somebody and you never know how negative that impact can be. So that kid that's got those dreams, the next Elon Musk, the next Jeff Bezos, you know, the, the big thinkers, right. Yeah. Um, you have, you know, there are some people that are wired to have a mindset to just not ever accept no. But my point for all of that is after that day, when Harley Davidson said, hell kid, I did it. You can do it. Anytime somebody would say, no, you can't do that. I would say in my mind, I would say, no, you won't do it. I'm going to do it, but you're not going to do it because you ain't doing it. You're sitting right there in that chair doing whatever you're doing. And you're just giving me bad advice, but I'm going to do it. I don't know how <laughs> I'm taking action yeah. and I'm going to zig and zag my way to the finish line eventually. Well, that's a lot of it, man. It's just like you said, zig and zag, you know, you have ups, you have downs, but eventually you just stay on that path. You'll get to where you want to be as long as you can lock out all the mechanisms, you know, and just, you know, stay true to yourself and know that what you're fighting for and what you're doing for is going to be worth it all in the end, you know, and it's just, you know, I always hate it when people tell me stuff like that, you know, as far as, you know, going back to school or pursuing, you know, a, a fitness goal or writing a book. I mean, I've never read a book, but, you know, someone's like, well, I can't do that because I'm not you. And it's like, well, and it's kind of what your boy Harley Davidson says, it's like, hey, man, you know, I'm nothing special, dude. I mean, you know, me personally speaking, I mean, if I've gone this far in life and, you know, I've got through the ups and downs, I mean, you can do it, too. And I. I think it's just people need that extra push, you know, and it was kind of one of these things when even I started my podcast, you know, and people were like, what, why? You know, yeah. like, why are you doing that for? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I want to, I like podcasts, you know, i see what happens, you know, if it's shit, it's shit, but I would like to at least take a chance at it. You know, it's something yeah. to at least hear, uh, you know, the gun go off and like, Oh man, let me see what happens. You know, at least I try Then, you know, then you live with no regrets and yeah, it's these type of mindsets, man, that, you know, again, I'm probably generally speaking, of course, but people just like to let the world beat them down and tell them that they're no good. And I stole that from Rocky Marciano right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that popped in my head right there, but I don't know why, but it did. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the interviews, this stuff, right? Like some, a guy was like, dude, you need to start the single seat podcast. And I'm like, I have way too much stuff on my plate. And they're like, then he's like, well, why don't you just, why don't you ask people to be on their podcast? And I was like, why not? No, I could do that. And I was thinking on, on, from your vantage point, you said you've never written a book before. Dude, you, I don't know how many of these you've recorded, but like you could just literally listen to every single one of your own podcasts. Boom. There's your whole book. It's, I don't know, call it Scheller's select (laughs) guests or whatever you want to call it. Like a, uh, yeah, dude, I think that you've already written your book, right? You just got to repackage the information you already have. So that's pretty cool. I didn't, I know that just kind of hit me right now. I've been wanting to do maybe not a book because, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I don't know, just, I never thought about a book, but I've wanted to do something of to that nature that, you know, like you just said, like take everything 
that I've been doing, talking about people that have been on the show and be like, hey, right, you know, let's put all these, you know, little pearls and gems into something that if people want to listen to or just, you know, like, like you said, like this 10 minutes, you know, like, yeah. you know, you know, Dom's over here talking about this, you know, this is how he got his, you know, call sign, which I'm supposed to ask you that. I know because I'm okay. supposed to ask you that. And, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like little tidbits like that. And just like, oh, you know, why did he create, you know, you know, single seat mindset and all these books and this cool shit like that. That's like, and just keep them motivated, keep them going, keep them inspired. You know, like I'm one of those people who like to go back and look at random quotes on, you know, uh, if it's Instagram or in a book that I found and copied into my phone or something, just like if I'm having a shit day, just, ah, yeah. like that stupid yeah. Rocky Marciano code I just said, yeah. Oh man, you find that on a YouTube video real quick and let me listen to that in the morning. Okay. Now I'm ready. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Gives you a different perspective. Yeah. And like in, in your, in your case, like you've got a podcast, which are, they're powerful, right? Cause people plug an earbud in and they just listen to the whole thing. Exactly. Maybe they don't listen to, you know, YouTube. I don't know a lot of people that sit down and watch YouTube podcasts, but uh, maybe there's some people that do that. I'm sure there is. Um, you know, you got other people that read books. You got people that uh, want a two minute read on a blog, right? So like, dude, you got your blog that you start with each one of your podcasts and you just give your, Ramp. your five minute synopsis. So you got, I mean, dude, you got off ramps to like all the different stuff. Um, you know, it makes it exciting, right? Cause now you've got people that like your message. They like what you're doing. Maybe they start listening to one of them. They're like, that's really cool. But then they click on the link and they just read the rest of it or whatever. Right. You know, and they, you got ideas free flowing all over the place there. <laughs> That's kind of one of the cool things about it is that when I start talking, especially, you know, with people with, you know, same type of mindsets, I would say is myself, uh, so to speak that, you know, ideas start flowing and you bounce ideas off each other. It's like, Hey, that makes perfect sense. Like you said about the book right there. It's like, well, I would have never really, I don't think I would have ever thought about something like that rather not, not have this conversation. And it's like, yeah, man, this is what it's all about right here. You know, we can express yeah. ideas and, you know, and I'm, I'm wrong a lot of the time, but I go back and try to fact check myself on things I've said and stuff. Or yeah. mistake, like, okay, let's fix that for next time. So, yeah. And dude, I don't know. I don't know. Like it probably exists, but dude, a, a compilation book of like all your episodes, but in just, um, Oh dude, the book that's sitting. So this is kind of a book that I read every once in a while, but, uh, coach John, uh, wooden. Ooh, good. Uh, yeah. I got one He's, of yeah, he's it's basically his lifetime observation and reflections on and off the court, right? So sports coach kind of thing. But like, dude, your podcast, right, could be these little, uh, you know, one of them leadership is more than facts, right, dude, and it's three paragraphs. So like you take, you take the top three little nuggets you got out of every single podcast you did. Yep. And you're not only given credit to the podcast uh, guest that you interviewed, um, the information is already there. So like people think like in regards to the mindset, like if you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to write a book cause it's hard. That's not a good reason not to write a book. Right. But then somebody needs to give you permission, dude, <laughs> Chris, I've written books. If I can write books, you can write a book for <laughs> sure. So I give you permission to write books and then like action. Right. So now as you start doing it, the best way to write a book is to open up a word document and to just go chapter one and just to start writing and dude, just realize the fewest times I've edited something like the fewest edits on any manuscript I've ever done. Now, granted, I'm a little bit, I'm not of a, a like superior, not, uh, you know, intelligence or any that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. Right. Like dude, I'll, but I'll grind it out. I'll, I'll get to the finish line is seven. I've had to really, scrutinize a manuscript seven times. And that's the fewest times. My first book, dude, it was so, it was a, it was a book for my real estate investors. It was like 14 years of notes. And I found myself sitting down and taking dudes to lunch. Um, and that business is specifically for fighter pilots and, and, uh, pilots to passively invest in multifamily real estate. But it's a big upfront commitment of money, right? It's more than most people, you know, you can't just walk to somebody and be like, dude, the entry costs 50 grand, yeah. right? Like that's a hard thing to hear. It's like, well, how? So I wrote that book so that I could hand it to people because a lot of people go, oh, that sounds really interesting. And then I hand them the book and it's like, 
this dude's serious about this, right? Chris Scheller, he, your dude, you're serious. You got a book, dude. And then on your podcast, you're, you, you can promote your own book, right? And it could be just the top 10 lessons from 20, you know, 19, whatever to 20, whatever. Right. So I don't know. I think, I think there's something there uh, for sure. Um, Especially because you have all the people that you talk to, dude, like you got all those lessons right there. Yeah, you're hyping me up about this right now. I was sitting here writing notes about it as you're talking. But you know, one thing, and like to your point though, like when people are uh, afraid of writing a book or not knowing how they're going to do it, there's a book uh, by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art, and he yeah. talks about how you just got to go there and just make yourself write, and then he calls it the muse, yeah. and it just comes to you, you know, yeah. and you start writing, and you know, it might be dog shit or whatever, but <laughs> then eventually, like, it starts to come, and then you whatever you write starts to turn into. No, I guess magic, if you want to say, or you actually, oh, I got something here. Now it's turning into something. But it, a lot of the whole point of it, for those who are just listening, is that just to start doing it and then it will come to you. You know, yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of people like they're just afraid to even start. You know, it's kind of what you said earlier too. And they, because either they're, they, like I said, you know, when people are like saying, like, oh, it's going to be trash. Why are you doing that? And yeah, that gets in your head. Then people are like, well, if I do this and put this out there, then what if I look like an idiot? You know, what if I, you know, get criticized? Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be a fool or anything. And that's one of the mistakes and the reason people don't try is because, you know, what if something bad happens? And maybe that's part of the mind being the, uh, the survival instinct that's training you not to take a chance at this because it's trying to protect you. But yeah. it's not allowing you. Guess to- what? It will happen. You will fail. People will make fun of you, dude. Yeah. And you'll have... You'll have 200 people that come to you and be like, dude, this is gold, man. I love this. I love what you're doing. Um, you know, our our single seat series books. So single seat mindset, it's a business, but we give all the money to a children's cancer foundation. So nice. our why is very powerful, right? Not only are we helping the next generation, we're giving back, we're sharing our stories, we're, we're helping peak performers, we're helping people achieve and, and think, right? Like not only I can do this, but I've been given permission to do it. And now I can take action and I know that I can, right? But then we give all the money to charity. So it's kind of like, Dude, if you want to talk about purpose rolling out of bed in the morning, it's like, dude, that gives you a lot of purpose versus just trying to, I mean, some, a, a failure of mine, like just trying to accumulate material trappings of this world. And after a while, it's like, how, how much junk are you going to accumulate? And how much money are you going to need? Uh, and I think it was one of my cousins. She's, she's fiery. She actually introduced me to my wife, but like she would goes, when is enough enough? Mm. And it kind of, it kind of pissed me off when she asked me that because I was like, I'm an achiever. I'm going to buy more real estate. I'm going to keep doing this. And, huh. and then that was just like, okay, if I put my pride aside, when is enough enough? And now it's fun, but it doesn't give me the purpose that the single seat mindset company gives me, right? Which is, we know we're helping families that have kids in the hospital going through cancer treatments. Like, dude, that's all, that's a big thing in itself. Yeah. But then we're also sharing our stories and helping people, you know, that way. And dude, I'll like, if somebody asks for a book, dude, I will send you a book. Won't even think about it. Right. There's no catch type of thing. That so is. like, so I think there's, there's a piece behind it. The, the action piece, like you were saying, like Stephen Pressfield, that's a great freaking book mm-hmm. is literally lock yourself in the room shut, like put your cell phone in your bedroom. Don't even have it anywhere near you. Uh, if you can have a computer that doesn't have access to the internet (laughs) before too, you know, and just get going and dude, it's going to suck. And I've, that I've kind of hinted at it earlier that the, the more books you read, you'll start to see trends, right. And you've probably seen it too, but like action is one of them. And the other one is action oriented individuals, goal setters, peak performers, like people that want to achieve something and get somewhere they're, they, they know that they might fail, but that doesn't stop them. And, and if you look at, oh man, I don't, I don't know the actual statistic, but if you looked at like Michael Jordan, right? Like arguably in my generation and yours, the best basketball player, right? Like not Steph Curry, not LeBron James, like Michael Jordan. Uh, dude, if you look at how many times he missed, right? Just think of that. Like, I think the best basketball player of all time, dude, I want to say it's like 26% or something, right? So like, think of that every time he set out and he's like one of the best basketball players in the world, maybe probably find this on the internet right now. But like, dude, think about that. You fail the majority of the time over 70% of the time you're failing. So 
action takers are, are so driven to get to their goal, right? They're, they're sprinting that they're not necessarily, uh, avoiding like, dude, I don't have any problems sprinting down the wrong path and then just turning around and sprinting back and being like wrong path, dudes, let's go down a different path. (laughs) And meanwhile, as I sprint back from that path, all the people that were sitting there just like figuring, well, I don't, I got to figure out, like, I got to figure out is that path is that path there, there goes Dom again, right? Like, boom, I'm down the other path. And I'm like, come back. Nope, not that path either. And then I'm like, I found the path and I'm already 50% of the head of them, you know? Yeah. That, that's a good point, man. Like a lot of people who seem to be and like, you talk about trends and seeing it over the books that, you know, talking with people like yourself, it seems to be uh, a trend or a common theme that I've noticed that people who do things big with their life, you know, succeed in whatever areas their passions are that they're not afraid to take that risk and go take a chance at something. And just like you said, go down that path and, you know, okay, well, like you said, it sucked. That was not what I wanted to. Let me go around and redo it. Yeah. I lost some time there, but yeah. And it just seems like, you know, you take those chances, you take those risks and, and at the end of it, you know, you find some gold in some form of or another. And yeah, it's one of those things that I've started to learn too. Cause like I told you in the very part of this podcast, I'm one of those guys that's like, uh, well, let me see. Let me analyze everything. I don't know if it's going to be the right move for me, but yeah, I'm I'm looking for those green lights now. When I see something, like, oh, let's go take a chance. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, dude, your your podcast will potentially be the thing that you said yes to. You took action on, right? And you're now you're podcasting. You're talking to people. You're getting ideas. And yeah. dude, there might be a guy that like one day you're just talking. You're like, oh, I could do that. Right. And that's, that's how the single seat mindset business started. It started with a weekly email and I called it something ridiculous, dude. I, I'm not even say it out loud. It was so dumb. And it was, it was, I, I look back and dude, like the first class of like young fighter pilot students that saw these emails, they're terrible. I mean, the, the message was there, right? Like, but in regards to, uh, you know, packaging it the right way and just sending it out and like having it short, punchy, anecdotal and helpful. I missed the mark. And yeah, I got made fun of dude. I I wasn't about to stop. Like that just means it's not good for that person or maybe I need to make it better. And then pretty soon we have a website and we have some other books and dude, I I published, I had a dude help me publish my first book. Right. So I had an editor and all those things. Right. And it turned out pretty good. Well then I was like, I can do this myself. That was really expensive. I'll just do it myself and do the next two books were terrible. <laughs> Absolutely terrible, dude. When you talk about like, well, did you hire a cover designer? Nope. I just did it myself, dude. And it was, it was horrible. And so here's the bad thing about it. And, and because I don't fear failure, Amazon won't take them off. They won't. So you, you can put that they're not available for sale and they won't sell, but dude, it's a reminder to me uh, that just because I failed, I didn't stop. Right. And I, I, I redid them and, and we now have them and they're better, but like, yeah. it just reminds me every day looking at them that, yeah, I don't fear failure. I'm just, yeah, you're going to take some, take some hard knocks along the way. We'll just freaking pick yourself back up and get going again. That's it, dude. You know, we, we yeah. shut this whole podcast and yeah, man. And I'm, it works out, you know, at the end, like you said, it's like the iceberg theory too. That, you know, everyone sees like where you start at and, you know, all the cool things about it. Like if you're at the top of your game, like Michael Jordan, but they don't never see that. And this is what I was going to ask you earlier. They never see like all the hard work you had to do and all the mistakes that were made, like yeah. everything underneath the water. And what I was going to ask you that, you know, like, you know, when you're flying and like bring it to like a sports analogy that, you know, when Tom Brady's playing and when he's off the field, he's probably still, you know, studying and just game film and practicing and doing all that things. Is that kind of what it takes to be, a firefighter too, like, you know, with these decisions that you're going to be, yeah, so many flight time hours, practice, training, whatever it's called. And then like you're sitting in your room alone, like studying books, the manuals and whatever. And like, Hey, if I want to be, you know, a certain level, I got to be in here knowing every bits and pieces of that aircraft or what I need to yeah. do. Yeah. hundred percent, dude. Like the, the first airplanes you fly, they go like a hundred miles an hour, right? The, the little, the little ones, right. And you're, then the next airplane up that I flew had an ejection seat. You could fly upside down. You could pull seven or eight G's with it. Like, and it was, I don't know, it had like 1200 horsepower, dude, it was a little go-kart with two seats in it. And it would go to like almost 300 miles an hour. So things are going a lot faster. So dude, you, you talk about going back to your room and studying. I would study as much as I could. Now I'd close my eyes. I would sit in the bathtub with a toilet plunger 
as like the control stick. And I would literally just sit there with my eyes closed and they call it chair flying in my case, like bathtub flying. But I would just go, okay, so I take off, I need to put the the landing gear up and then, okay, I need to put the flaps up and then I need to like hit this button and I need to push over and talk to departure. And I need to say this radio call and the radio call button is, oh, it's over here. Right. So like, and dude, I would argue that you do that with your, your podcast even, because if you're teaching a class or if you're lifting weights or you're running or whatever, dude, you're thinking about like, Hey, I heard this on this. Like my next guest is this. And like, Man. you kind of are doing your own chair flying as well. And the reason why that's powerful is that you know that you're doing something that has some purpose when you're subconsciously thinking about it and dude, there's a lot of power. And just before you go to. Oh, like your, your subconscious just kind of makes it happen. You get nervous before you go flying? Not anymore. I'm just, I mean, like, I'm, I guess where I got that from is because, you know, when you're really, like you said, you know, your purpose and stuff like right before you get ready to go do something big, you know, like in my competitions or stuff, I still get a little nervous and you're like, yeah, oh, shit, you know, like. What's going That's on? great, dude. Use that, use that to your advantage. I think that if you don't get nervous, that maybe now granted, do I get nervous now? I mean, if I'm doing like a check ride, cause we have to do checkouts to make sure that we're, you know, in with, with another instructor to make sure that we're still doing what we should be doing. But like, if I'm going to go fly with a student, I'm not really nervous cause I've done it so much, but dude, when I was a young instructor and I was going through an instructor upgrade and I was trying to prove myself. Heck yes, dude. I was nervous every single flight mm -hmm. because the guys that I'm flying with are way better than me mm -hmm. and I'm trying to prove myself. Right. So I think, you know, you can let that just completely break you down or just realize that nerves and that kind of stuff are part of the game and, and roll with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I guess it's like you said that the more you do it, the better you get, but I could definitely see just, being a young person that's not not trying to screw up, especially if you don't want to be that guy and people getting upset at you, you don't want to, you know, get made fun of. And I'm sure being in the military, you, you know, the, it's hard to live some of that stuff down, right? Yeah, it happens a lot. <laughs> but and going back a little bit, I was I was supposed to ask you, you know, um, so how did you get your uh, the name slice? I know you've been asked that probably a million times, but I'm sure my listeners would want to know. Yeah, so the um, the short story is that I've been I've been called a lot of things in my life. Okay. And slice actually is a pretty good one that I eventually, uh, got, but on a, an upgrade, uh, flight when I was a, a young, young fighter pilot, uh, learning, learning the ropes. Um, I broke some training rules and so did my instructor pilot, but I broke some training rules cause we were, uh, as you've seen on like top gun, you know, where they like dog fight and you pass really close and then the jets start turning and you kind of run your tactics to, you know, figure out how to kill the guy first. So that's what we were doing. We were doing some it was very high G, uh, very physically demanding fights. We landed, we got gas on the ground. We took back off. So we, it was, it was a lot of different dog fighting stuff they were doing that day. Well, one of them, the fight went straight up and we were pointing at each other too long and we both were shooting each other. And I honestly can't remember. He, he probably shot me at, he's the instructor. He's better than I was, but uh, we ended up just pointing at each other too long. We broke some training rules and we ended up passing super close. So when it came time to name me, they said, I tried to slice my, uh, my instructor pilot in half, but also <laughs> I was in the, a squadron that was the samurai in Japan. So the, the samurai sword, like slice and uh, it, it kind of fit, but more or less like we, we passed super close to each other, uh, and almost died. Um, which is why I got that call sign. So is that normally how it goes that depending on like what you do in the air or depending on what you're doing on the ground, that's, they find some, your, your, your boys find some kind of way to <laughs> usually it's usually your, your call sign kind of grows on you. It's not something that you're like, yeah, I want to be called Harley Davidson, right? Like that <laughs> dude was an anomaly. He was just a good dude, like all around, like you would want to name that guy Harley, but like, dude, there's some guys that come through and usually you get a call sign because you did something stupid okay. or you, yeah. Or you consistently did something stupid. And like I said, dude, I've been called a lot worse. Um, but once, once you, once you deploy and you, um, do certain things, it's, it's less likely that you'll get renamed essentially. 
Mm. So I've been lucky. I've, I've held on to slice. <laughs> so, uh, so you can get renamed. The- it's pretty rare, but like- I've seen it happen. Um, usually it's a joke. Like it's a guy that's been around for maybe like three to five, six years. Yeah. And that he thinks he's pretty hot stuff. And then he comes into the squadron and he's a new guy. And then it's like a joke, like, Oh, we're going to name this guy. Right. We're going to rename him. And usually most of the time the guys just play it off. Sure. But if, if, if you have a big problem with it, well, then we're like, well, now it's just fun. Cause you don't like it. And we're going to, we're going to try to rename you. <laughs> did, uh, did you see the, all right, I'm, I'm assuming you saw, probably saw the new top gun movie, right? So this is going to surprise you. I haven't seen yeah. that yet. Okay. Um, so I guess what I was going to get at though, I mean, even in the old movie that I have a couple of friends who are in the military right now. Right. And that I work out with. And so a lot of them were saying that that movie was basically, I don't want, they didn't say dog shit, but like the way, I mean, if you would have seen it, you probably know, but the way they do one of the maneuvers at the end and they go into fight this, they don't really say what country it is or anything, obviously, but they're like, yeah. We, the army or the navy or whoever the air force or whoever it was wouldn't we, we wouldn't have done it that way you know yeah so it was just like that. yeah i mean there's there's some cinematography f- uh from it i would say from like a you know a, a hollywood standpoint i've heard that it's done really good i've heard that yeah, i watched and it I, it was awesome but yeah yeah and i think you know um you know tom cruise is not a real fighter pilot but he does fly sure uh jets right and dude that's that's something to be said about that, to be a civilian dude, to not have gone through like that training and to be able to do that. There's, there's some credit to that for sure. Yeah. Will you, will you explain G's to people? Yep. So sitting here in our seat, we are, it's acceleration due to gravity. So the earth, just based on the fact that we have gravity here, we have one G sitting here in the seat. Okay. If you're on the moon, don't quote me. I'm not an astronaut. There is an astronaut writing a chapter in this next book, a single seat wisdom, I but see. Uh, I think it's, I think it's, it's less than one G's, which is why you float. Right. Um, now acceleration due to gravity is basically your body weight. Every time you go up a G it's the weight of your body. So if you're pulling two G's, you're essentially, you know, if you're 200 pounds, you're 400 pounds, or if you're a hundred pounds or 200 pounds, that makes sense. So nine G's as a hundred pound person for simple math is 900 pounds. Now it sounds really bad, but if you're in our jet, the F-16 seat is back 30 degrees. Okay. Right. And so when you, if you're not standing straight up and down, the G's are a lot more tolerable. They still hurt and there's still things that you have to do, but like, it's just like going into a, a turn on a roller coaster, right? It's like being in a NASCAR where you get squished down into your seat. That's exactly the same feeling. It's just at a very much like a higher intensity. And if you don't do your, anti-g straining maneuver correctly you pass out gotcha. and you crash so wait when you say that uh that maneuver that anti-g training maneuver is that where i've heard people say like you you start yelling or like say like shoot <laughs> like you start doing something like that and that's how yep. you get the brain for or the blood force back up to your brain yep so you you tighten all of your lower extremities you tighten your muscles and that keeps a lot of the blood uh, from going just straight to your feet. But really what you need is you need blood and you need oxygen in your brain. So you can think and process information and that, um, you don't yell, but you do make a, like a, uh, every two to three seconds that you, you make a short air exchange. So you're not really breathing during your anti-G straining maneuver. You're kind of going, and then like you wait a couple of seconds and there's other things going on, right? It's, it's, it's more complex than that, but like, you're just, you're letting a little bit of air out and you're sucking a little air back in to keep the oxygen in your brain. Cause you have about five seconds of residual oxygen in your brain. And if you just sit there, like if you're sitting in the back seat, cause I've done a lot of incentive rides. Um, if I do a bunch of G's in the front seat and you're not ready for it in the back, you're at least not like tightening your muscles. Boom, dude, lights out. You're going to take a nap back in the back seat and pass out. And, and so that was one of the things about the movie too. There was, all right. And I, I guess it was, maybe was, was poorly explained, but there was a single seat aircraft. And then there was another aircraft usually flying with them. I guess their wingman who would yeah. like, do all the weapons, weapon stuff. Yeah. Two seater plane. Is that normal? Uh, it depends on, it depends on what fighter community you're in. So if, okay. um, if you're in F 16s, like myself, when we deploy, we are only single seat jets. Um, the F 35s, the F 22s, the a 10s, those are all single seat platforms that's it. Now the Navy, they, in the old days, Top Gun one, they had F 14s, two seater. 
they, they do have a two seater F 18, but there are also single seat F 18. So there really isn't, I don't know of any three seater fighter jets. Um, most of them are one seat. Okay. Um, some of them have two seats. Yeah. Like it was like a guy or a person like flying a plane. It was somebody like controlling weapons and like looking around the plane. Yeah. That's typically called like if that, if that is, if it's designed that way, it's called the weapon system, op, uh, there you go. Op, officer or operator. I don't even know. Cause we don't have them in our jets. So, but it's, it's a dude that's specially trained to sit back there. He's not a pilot, but dude, I think in a pinch, those guys, you know, if they, if they're in the jet long enough, they do know how to land the plane too. So, um, but they're not, they don't have pilot wings. They're uh, they're we call them whizzos. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Go rapid fire with you right now. Just cause I had some yeah. written down and, um, did you after ever have to eject out of a plane? I'm going to knock on some wood. So no, okay. I've done all the training for it. We know how to do it, but it's a pretty uh, violent experience. It's about 20 G's when that rocket under the ejection seat fires. So it squishes all the little marshmallows between your vertebrae. Uh, wow. so it's, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not a good thing No, because you throw the airplane away, but then it's also pretty violent. Ah, oh, man. I didn't know all that. It just seems pretty easy in the movies. <laughs> Just hit the plane and you're gone, but uh. <laughs> nope. Um, so you said you flew the F 16, right? Is that what you said? Yep. So, how fast would you say they go? Um, well, I think on Wikipedia it says it can go over Mach 2. So, the speed changes with altitude. So, the higher you go, the less dense the air is. So, the, the there's all different types of air speeds, okay. but for the lay person, I would say, um, you know, very easily it can do 800 plus miles an hour, you know, well over a thousand at different altitudes. Is Mach 2 two times faster than the speed of sound? Correct. Yeah. Okay, good. Nice. I had to, I had to look up some stuff. I, I did a little research, so. <laughs> <laughs> so halfway to talk to you intelligently. Um, so the hard deck, is that something like, is that an actual true thing? You can only get so close to the ground at certain feet is there, or is that just kind of whatever you want to do? Is that depend? So it, it, no, it's not whatever you want to do. So there's, um, we will set a simulated flight, uh, fight floor, which is like the ground, right? So for like young dudes out here in Arizona, it's like 10,000 feet. It's like, dude, if you, if you drop below 10,000 feet, it's like you hit the ground and you technically die in training. The hard deck is a, uh, in most of those are for training so that you don't die. Right. So the actual hard deck is the ground in real life. If you hit the ground, usually it wins and usually you die. But the, the, there's the Navy talks about it a little bit different than the air force, but we have fight floors and then we have like, no kidding a, uh, you know, if we're fighting with really experienced dudes, there's other levels that you can't go past in training, but in war, I mean, the training rules are to keep you alive while you train to like get your skill sets up. But in war, dude, if I'm, if I need to, I'll be down at, you know, 10 feet off the ground if I need to be. Okay. So yeah, it's just kind of like matter of a case by case, just if you needed. In training, it's pretty black and white. Right. When you're in wartime, it's, uh, do take your training and execute as you can to stay alive and, and to, to accomplish the mission. And I don't know how much you can or can't say, but I mean, were you ever in dog fights and stuff like that? Or? Um, there was the, the second deployment, there was, um, some stuff going on in, you know, the Iraq and Syria and Turkey and okay. lots of stuff going on over there with, uh, Iran and that kind of stuff. Um, there have been some, 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 uh, pretty close calls, okay. <laughs> but I haven't luckily, you know, I don't, I don't take any joy out of like killing other fighter pilots. Um, you know, we'd need, we would do it if we need to type of thing, but like that homie put a lot of time and effort in becoming a fighter pilot too. And you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, we try to deescalate as much as we can. And, and that's kind of where we were on our second deployment. Um, yeah, dude, shooting down fighter jets is a, it's a international thing. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not like the movies portray it. Yeah. I mean, you shoot, a, you shoot down a fighter jet, dude, like, the president of the country is going to know about it immediately. Right. Um, we, we, our jets without anything on them, they're about 40 million a piece. The F 35s, the new ones, those are 200 million. Like the F 22s, I don't even know how much those things are, but they're expensive. They're expensive little toys and they're more for, you know, deterrence at this point type of thing. 
That makes sense. Yeah, and it, I could imagine just like like you said, you know that guy put in his time to be a fighter pilot too, and just knowing that you're also taking a life, or if I even have to take it a life, that'd be a whole new, whole new level for humans. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're getting kind of short on time here, but I want I have one last question and this might be a little bit out there. So, and I'm, I'm assuming, or I'm going to assume that you would know who, uh, commander David Fravor is, you know who that is? Uh, I don't know that recognize that name. All right. Uh, I think he was a flight commander in the Navy and he's been going around on podcasts and he's been talking about how he's seen some weird stuff flying, like almost UFO alien type stuff. And he's, he's called it like a Tic Tac. And it's like stuff that was not physics of this earth where it would just like go up and down left and right where no other aircrafts can do that. It was jamming. I don't know what type of aircraft these, these pilots were in, but it was jamming their radar or jamming their seat, whatever it was. And then like, that's almost an act of war. And, and they just see like the speed is like these things just speed off. And of course the videos are very blurry and you really can't see anything, but, and I, I'm pretty sure he's well-respected in the military. I could be wrong, but just wondering if you've seen anything weird up there. I mean, a UFO, an unidentified flying object is, is exactly that. Like you can't identify it. And so, dude, I don't know of any extraterrestrial things that have gone on personally. Um, I'm more of a practical kind of guy. So I'm like, dude, there are a lot of drones nowadays. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can't explain. If you think about it, stealth technology was, you know, it's old. Like that's. Like the F-117, if you look that up, dude, that's an old aircraft. It's not flying anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but, dude, there's all sorts of beeps and squeaks and stuff shooting around everywhere. If you think about it, the F-35, which is a pretty new, it's like the, it's our newest fighter jet in the, um, the inventory here in the United States. Uh, and the Air Force, Navy, like it, it's flown all around the world. It's a partner nation aircraft. It's a great airplane. Uh dude, that airplane is already years old. So if that airplane that does crazy stuff is that old, what other crazy stuff do they have that like levitates and, you know, hypersonic stuff. And dude, I don't have, I don't have the brains for it, but I also don't have the capacity to even like process that type of information until we're told about it. So, you know, I've seen some, I've seen some weird stuff in the airplane, but most of the time, like, dude, if you see pictures and stuff, I'm, I'm not trying to discredit the guy. I just, I don't know. I don't know what he's looking at, you know, Everybody, you know, eyewitnesses in court, they're not necessarily the most, you know, it's kind of like what your brain process type of thing. So I don't know. I don't know what he's seeing. I am not seeing any of it. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I thought that'd be a fun question, but anyway, yeah. uh, let's take it home on that right there. Uh, Dom, you're a badass too, man. I appreciate you being here. If, uh, if people want to find the books, find you, find anything you want to plug, feel free to do all that. Yeah. So the, the, the home plate for everything is single seat mindset.com. Um, if you're listeners, this is not on, this is not on the website, but if you go to single seat mindset.com and put forward slash podcast gift, and you throw your name and email in there, I will send you a copy of, uh, a signed copy of our first volume of single seat wisdom for free. There's no, we don't sell data. We don't do anything like that. This is really to give back. Um, but the first three people that do that, get a free copy of the book and I'll make, I'll ship it right to them. So, but single seat mindset.com that's the, uh, the landing page and it's got all of the stuff right there for you. Dom, um, thanks again, dude. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. You're a badass too, man. Appreciate you. All yeah. right. We're gone folks. See you.